Hello everyone, this is Dr. M and welcome to my YouTube channel, My Tooth Study. I am here to help you out with the difficult concepts of dentistry so that you can apply them in your clinical practice as well as it can help you out to clear your dental board exams. I'm a trained oral and maxillofacial surgeon and the sole purpose of my channel is to help you out with the concepts of dentistry. As you all know, we have already started with the topic of orthodontics and today we'll be discussing about the topic of orthodontic appliances. It's a short and a brief video. Please do like, share and subscribe to my YouTube channel and also don't forget to click on the bell icon so that you get an update whenever I post another video. Also, I would really appreciate if every one of you would comment in the comment section about the content of the video, whether you like it or you won't like it. Also, I would like to share that I'll shortly be putting up a question series, which will be a hundred question series, which will be based upon the INBDE pattern so that it can help you out for preparing for your dental board exams. And also, if you want a detailed study material, you can contact me by clicking in the description box and clicking onto the Google form. By filling up the Google form, we'll be sending you a PayPal link. After the payment, you will get the detailed notes. It's a low cost involved uh, notes, which are purely uh, prepared by me. And uh, this would help you out in your dental boards preparation. So let's get started for today's video. Now, today we'll be discussing about the orthodontic materials. The orthodontic tooth movement is achieved by forces that are exerted on the tooth by an arch wire, the R bracket, during orthodontic treatment. The forces transmitted to a tooth depend on the physical and mechanical properties of the wire used and the relationship between the bracket in which the wire is engaged. The facial lingual and occlusal gingival dimensions of the edgewise bracket slot allows the use of wires with different cross-sectional shapes and sizes. The two orthodontic slot sizes or the bracket sizes most commonly used are approximately 0.018 into 0.025 inch and 0.022 inch into 0.028 inches. The magnitude of forces generated in the facial lingual and occlusion in gyral direction is partly dependent on the bracket slot size. Now coming on to the wire material properties. Now the important characteristics of the wire material properties first includes the stress and the strain. Now the stress strain relationship is the mechanical behavior of a ductile orthodontic wire. For example, a stainless steel wire. In tensile loading, which may be analyzed in a forced deflection or the stress strain plot, which is clearly visible through the graph here. The stress is the internal response of a wire to application of external forces defined as force, that is the load or the F, per cross-sectional area. So the stress is equal to force per unit cross-sectional area. Now, strain is the deformation or the deflection of the arch wire as a consequence of the stress and is defined as the dimensional change divided by the original dimension. Then the ideal characteristics. Now, the ideal characteristics of the orthodontic wire should have the following properties. It should have a high strength, low stiffness, high working range, high formability. Now, these are the important characteristics of wire which depend on the alloy composition, the crystal structure of the metal and the manufacturing process. Now the wire properties, each of the major elastic properties is affected by a change in the length and in the change in the cross section of the wire. So doubling the length of a wire decreases its strength by half, makes it eight times less stiff and gives it four times the range. Similarly, when the diameter of a wire is doubled, it becomes eight times more stronger and 16 times stiffer and its working range is decreased by half. Then coming on to the wire selection, for a large orthodontic movement, wire with a 
low load or deflection rate are desirable because they are able to provide constant low force as the tooth moves and the appliance is deactivated. However, for a minimal tooth movement, such as in maximum anchorage extraction cases or during finishing, a high load or a deflection rate is desirable. Now, there are several factors for the selection of the wire. Now, first is the wire material. It depends upon the load rate and is proportional to the modulus of elasticity of the material. A stainless steel exhibits the highest modulus of elasticity and the most flexible wire is made up of nickel titanium or the nitide. The wire cross section is the load rate varies directly with the fourth power of the diameter of the round wire with the third power of the width of the rectangular wire. The wire length rate basically varies inversely to the third part of the length of the wire segment. Decreasing the interbracket distance by incorporating loops or helix into the arch wire decreases the, its load rate. Then the orthodontic arch wire material, the most commonly used is the nickel titanium or the nitide. These wires offer two very important characteristics. The first one is a very low modulus of elasticity and an extremely wide working range. A beta titanium. These wires are frequently known as the TMA or the titanium molybdenum alloy wires. They have an intermediate modulus of elasticity. They exhibit excellent resilience. It provides a wide working range. One drawback of these wires is their high coefficient of friction. They have high formability, which allows the clinician to bend the wire and incorporate stops or loops into them if desired. Now, they can also be spot welded. Now, stainless steel, the stainless steel wires remain popular because of their good mechanical properties, excellent corrosion resistance, and a very low cost. The typical composition of stainless steel alloys used in the orthodontics is 18% chromium and 8% nickel, the 18A. Another very important question for our dental boards. Now, chromium gives this wire its corrosion resistance. Now, when compared with the nitide and beta titanium arch wire, these wires exhibit the highest elastic modulus and low spring back. They can be soldered and as well as welded. Now, the orthodontic appliances. The orthodontic appliance, the first of all, is a fixed appliance. Now, in modern orthodontic treatment, a straight wire system are the commercially available appliances most commonly used. In the originally, a standard edgewise appliance, the orientation of the bracket slot was at 90 degree angles to the long axis of the tooth, and the thickness of the bracket base was same for all the teeth. Now, during this treatment, the bends were placed to position each tooth individually in the buccolingual direction to provide a proper angulation in the mesiodistal direction and in the buccolingual direction. The straight wire appliance system, this information is incorporated in the bracket for each individual tooth, eliminating or reducing the need for first order, second order, and the third order bends. But these built-in adjustments in the bracket slot help to achieve a proper positioning for each individual tooth. The pre-adjusted edgewise appliances generally control the following factors. First is the rotational control by a twin bracket wing or by the incorporation of rotational arms in a single wing bracket system. A horizontal control by varying the relative thickness of the bracket base for the teeth of different thickness. The mesial tip control, the slot of the bracket is angulated relative to the base of the bracket to provide proper tipping. Then the torque, now the torque generally of this slot is angulated labial lingually to provide the proper root and crown moment. Now coming on to the brackets. Now most commonly the brackets are used of various types. The metal brackets which we have very commonly seen, the ceramic bracket, brackets made up of the monocrystalline or the polycrystalline ceramics. Although they are highly aesthetic, now these brackets are prone to fracture during the torsional and the tipping activation. They exhibit increased frictional resistance to sliding mechanics and they can also cause abrasion of the opposing tooth. Then self-ligating brackets, which has a locking system, which is incorporated into the brackets. The mechanism eligates the need for signature placement, ligature placement. It is, uh, the, it is that 
These systems shorten the treatment time by reducing the friction and because the wire is efficiently kept engaged in the bracket slot. However, these claims are controversial and generally unsubstantiated scientifically. Then comes the bats. Now, in the contemporary orthodontic treatment, all of the tooth, including the molars, may be bonded. However, banding the molar tooth is preferred by many clinicians. Before banding, the separators are placed between the teeth to create enough space to allow the band fitting and subsequent cementation. Then comes the bond. Now, these are the various steps of the bondings which we take place. Now, the procedure basically consists of the enamel prophylaxis with the pumice. Now, this procedure basically involves the removal of the pellicle, enhances the vegetability of the enamel. Then is the enamel etching. The most commonly used enamel etching agent is 31% of the phosphoric acid. The conventional acid etching creates a microporous enamel surface that increases the retention of the resin. The enamel surface is then coordinated with the application of a primer. A sandwich primer, which is a one-step procedure, combines the conditioning and the priming in a single step. The main advantage of the self-etching primer is reduced clinical chair time. Then comes the bracket positioning. Now, each bracket is placed in a position relative to a tooth in the same arch to ensure proper relationship. If a light cured type of composite resin is used, once the bracket is positioned, the adhesive is cured using a light such as a halogen LED or a plasma light. Now, appliances to modify the growth of the maxilla and the mandible. Now, these appliances allow the differential growth of the jaws. During adolescence, the mandible has more potential for growth than the maxilla. But then extra oral force, which can be a headgear or a functional appliance, is used to modify growth in class 2 patients. Now, the differential mandibular globe growth is expected with the res restraint of the maxilla. The growth modification is more successful in pre-adolescent children with a good compliance and a growth potential. The first of all is a headgear. Now, a headgear is used to modify the growth of the maxilla to distalize or protract the maxillary teeth or to reinforce anchorage. There are different types of headgears which can be used to achieve desired effects. The type of headgear and desired force level should be selected according to the specific treatment objective for a patient. A headgear should be worn preferably for 12 to 14 hours per day, another important question for dental boards, to achieve the proper goal. For orthopedic changes, a force level is 250 to 500 grams per side. For dental moments, it is 100 to 200 grams per side. Success of these headgear treatments depend upon the patient's compliance as well. Now, first is coming on to the high pull headgear. Now, commonly used in the treatment of pre adolescent with a class 2 malocclusion and increased vertical dimension, minimal overbite, and increased gingival exposure and smile. It consists of a high pull strap and a standard face bow inserting in the headgear tubes, which is then further in inserted the maxillary first permanent molar. The objective are restriction of the anterior and downward maxillary growth and molar distal movement, intrusion, control of the maxillary molar eruption. And cervical pull headgear. Now this is used to correct the class two malocclusion with a deep bite. It consists of a cervical neck strap and a standard face bow inserting into the headgear tubes to the maxillary first permanent molar. The objectives are to restrict the anterior growth of the maxilla, to distalize and erupt the maxillary molars. Because of the direction of the line of force, the supplies produces an extrusive and distal force on the maxillary first molars. The J-hook headgear. It consists of a high pull head strap that attaches to a two-hook on the anterior part of the maxillary arch wire. This J-hook design delivers intrusive and posteriorly directed extra oral forces to the anterior maxilla. However, it is generally used to retract the canines and the incisors rather than for the orthopedic purposes. Then comes the protraction headgear or the reverse pull headgear or the face mask. Using the patients with the class 3 malocclusion, where there is maxillary deficiency, it is adjustable and consists of the two pads that rest on the soft tissue of the forehead and the chin that are connected by a midframe, as you can see here in that image. A metal bar with hooks are connected to the frame 
which allows the attachment of the elastics to exert a downward and a forward pull on the mancilla. Then comes a chin cup. It is used to correct the class three malocclusion, which results from the excessive mandibular growth in young children by restraining or by redirecting the mandibular growth. It consists of a head strap and a cup that fits on the patient's chin to exert superior and posterior forces that usually also cause the opening rotation of these mandibles. Then comes the functional appliances. Now, functional appliances hold the mandible in a protrusive position and transmit the forces created by resulting a stretch of the muscles and soft tissues to the dental and skeletal components. And it produces the movement of the teeth and modification of growth. Because most functional appliances are removable, patient compliance plays a major role. Whether a fix or removable, these appliances restrain the maxilla and displace the mandible, which allows the normal growth. Now coming on to the first type of appliance, it is the Herbst appliance. It is a fixed functional appliance that consists of a piston and a tube device that places the mandible in the forward position as the patient closes their mouth. It usually cemented or bonded to the maxillary and mandibular arches. There is a tendency for the mandibular incisor to procline because of the forces that are indirectly delivered. Then comes an activator. This was the first removable appliance developed. The name activator was given because of the belief that mandibular growth was activated to correct the class 2. This term is generic and is used today to describe the functional appliance that is used for this purpose. It consists of an acrylic body that covers the part of the palate and a lingual aspect of the mandibular alveolar ridge. A facial bow fits anterior to the incisors on the acrylic adjacent to the posterior teeth. Facets are cut to allow the distal occlusal and buccal movements. On the lingual aspect of the mandibular posterior teeth, the facets allow the occlusal and the medial movement. In addition to their effects on the growth of the mandible, these appliances can tip the anterior teeth and control the eruption. Then comes the bionator. This removable appliance is a lesser bulkier option than the activator. It consists of a lingual horseshoe-shaped acrylic with a wire in the palatal area. Facets are introduced in to guide the maxillary and mandibular posterior teeth and hold the mandible forward. A labial bow is present anterior to the maxillary incisors extending distally to eliminate the pressure. Then comes the twin block appliance. This removable or the cemented appliance has two part design. The interaction between the maxillary and mandibular parts control the mandible that it is postured forward and how much the maxilla and mandible are separated. This appliance is supposedly more easily tolerated by the patients because of its two parts. Then comes the mandibular anterior positioning appliances, which is the Mara. It is consists of an oversized stainless steel crown on the maxillary and mandibular molars. Elbows that insert into the tubes on the maxillary crowns and arms protrude from the mandibular crowns. Because of the designs of the appliance, the lower arm interferes with the patient and attempts to bite down, forcing the mandible to be positioned forward in a class one. This results in the anterior force of the mandibular arch and posterior force to the maxillary arch. Then coming on to a non-compliant appliance to correct the class two malocclusion. Because of the compliance is a major concern when treating class two fixed appliances not requiring patient cooperation has been developed. Their use is generally indicated in patients with the full or the cusp to cusp, that is the molar canine relationship or the end-on relationship, with a mild to moderate crowding, approximately 0 to 6 mm, and a profile and the other characteristics that do not support the extraction treatment plan. First is the pendulum appliance. This is cemented appliance consists of an acrylic body to use the palate as the anchorage with the wire extension to the maxillary premolars. Two springs extending from the posterior portion of the appliance are inserted into the lingual molar attachments and are activated to distalize these molar teeth. If the expansion of maxilla is also needed, an expansion screw may also be incorporated into the acrylic body in the mid palatal In this case, the appliance is called as a pendix. Then is the forces fatigue resistant device, which consists of a bypass rod, a push rod, a ball pin, and a stainless steel spring module. 
for each side. Now, this inter arch force delivery system has been shown to be efficient in treating the class two malocclusions with a minimal compliance and breakage problem. It delivers forward downward force to the anterior mandibular arch and backward and upward force to the posterior maxillary arches. Then comes the aligners, which is the recent technology utilized. These are the clear removable aligners or the invasive lines, which can be used to align the teeth. A series of trays are manufactured according to the prescription developed by the provider and which is worn by the patient. Additional attachments are usually required to aid in specific tooth movements. Control of the tooth movement is not as precise as the fixed appliances. Now, patient cooperation is required for wearing these trays full time. Then coming on to the appliances to correct the posterior crossbite. Maxillary and mandible expansion appliances are used to correct the transverse discrepancies by skeletal expansion of the maxilla. If expansion is carried out at a rate of 0.5 mm per day, it is called as rapid maxillary or the palatal expansion. Slow expansion is carried out much slower at 1 mm per week. First appliance is the Hyrex appliance, also known as the Bandit Type 1, for skeletal expansion. Now, bands are cemented on the maxillary first three molars and molars and are connected to an expansion screw. The screw is activated by at least 0.25 mm and a daily produces a force of 100 newtons. The maxillary arch width is increased by opening the mid palate suture. The expansion is usually continued until the lingual cusps of the maxillary posterior teeth come into the contact with the lingual inclines. A diastema usually appears between the central incisors as the mid palate suture separates. Now, when an active expansion is completed, the retention for three to six months is recommended. However, it is widely believed that the skeletal component is more significant than the dental component. Then comes is the HAS appliance. Now, HAS appliance for skeletal expansion consists of band which is cemented in the maxillary premolars and molars. It is believed the contact with the palate allows with the appliance to be applied directly to the underlying hard palate and the soft tissues. However, the difficulty in maintaining hygiene and possible inflammation of the palate is considered the biggest disadvantage. Then comes the Holly's appliance, which is a Holly's removable appliance in a jack screw for skeletal and dental expansion. This appliance may be used to correct mild posterior crossbite in children and young adults. Compliance and difficulty re re retaining the appliance in the mouth are potential disadvantages. Then the quads, helix, and the W arch generally for the dental expansion. These appliances consist of stainless steel wire with a four, which is the quad, or the three, that is the W helix, which are incorporated to increase the range and flexibility. They may be fixed or may be removable. They may be used for symmetrical and asymmetrical expansion of the maxillary dental arch and correcting the rotating molars. Because of the tendency to cause the buckle tipping, they are suggested to use in cases where only a small amount of expansion is needed or in young children for skeletal expansion before the sutures are developed. Then comes the transpalatal arch. For dental movement, this appliance consists of heavy wire that extends from one maxillary molar along the contour of the palate to the maxillary first molar on the opposing side. The arch is adapted to contour the palate approximately 2 to 3 mm. This appliance is very versatile because it may be used in expansion or constriction of the intermolar width for producing the root movement of the first molar or for derotation of the steel and for the anchorage reinforcement. But the appliances which are utilized in the mixed dentition consists of the man's appliance, the lower lingual arch appliance, or some lip bumpers. Now, a man's appliance is used as a space maintainer. It has a heavy wire which is soldered to the palatal aspect of the maxillary first permanent molar and connected to an acrylic button located in the most superior and anterior part of the palatal wall. A lower arch lingual appliance is used for heavy orthodontic with the heavy orthodontic wire to the lingual aspect of the mandibular incisors. It may be fixed or it may be removable. Now the two U loops in the wires mesial to the first molars may make it possible to adjust this appliance more. The lingual arch may be used for anchorage of reinforcements such as holding arch for space maintenance, for expansion and for increasing dental arch length. 
then comes, comes the lip bumper, consists of the heavy wire inserted in the buccal tube on the mandibular first permanent molars. It is used to control and increase the mandibular dental arch length to upright the mesial and lingually tipped mandibular molars and to prevent the interposition of the lower lip between the maxillary and mandibular incisors. By removing the pressure of the buccal musculature of the teeth, it allows lateral and anterior dental alveolar de development. By transmitting the force from the lip to the mandibular first molar, it causes distal movement and tipping of the mandibular first molars. Then the appliances which are used to control the vertical incisor position. These are the intrusion arches. This is an arch wire used for deep bite correction in which the extrusion of the molars and intrusion of the incisors take place. Then comes out the extrusion arch. This is the arch wire used for open bite correction in which the intrusion at the molars and the extrusion of the incisors take place. Then comes the elastics. Now, elastomeric bands are used to produce forces for tooth movements. The different types of elastics are used for this purpose depending upon the purpose, location, and the orientation. The class one elastic or the intramaxillary elastics are used for traction between teeth and the group of teeth within the same arch. During canine retraction, they may be used for sliding mechanism. The class two or the intermaxillary ones, which are worn from a tooth located in the anterior part of the maxilla to the tooth located in the posterior part of the mandible. They are used to correct the class two malocclusion to reduce the overbite by extruding the molars to retract the anterior maxillary teeth and to minimize the anchorage loss in the maxilla during the maxillary incisor retraction. In class three or the intermaxillary elastics, which are worn in a tooth located in the posterior part of the maxilla and anterior part of the mandible. They are used to aid in protraction of the maxillary posterior teeth to improve the overjet in an edge-to-edge -edge or anterior crossbite relationship to make use of the intermaxillary anchorage during the mandible incisor retraction. Then as the crossbite elastics which are worn from the palatal of one or more maxillary teeth to the buccal of one or more teeth in the mandible. In addition to the desired forces, they cause extrusion of the teeth and should be used with caution. In patients especially with open bite tendency and long lower anterior facial height. Anterior diagonal elastics, now these elastics run from one side of the maxillary teeth to the other side of the mandibular teeth, crossing the midline. They are used in correction of non-coinciding maxillary and mandibular dental midlines. So with the topic of these elastics, we come to the end of this video. I hope you liked the video. Please do comment into the comment section and tell me about whether you're liking the content or whether you want any certain changes into the content. And also don't forget to like, share and subscribe to this video and also click on the bell icon so that you get an update whenever I upload a video. So thank you.